the space race. A two-horse race, you might think, between America and the Soviet Union. But for a short time, there was an unlikely third player in the world of rocket research. Britain was the top scientific group in the world. I think we were unsurpassed as regards innovative thinking, frankly. So what happened to the UK's rocket program? The answer is one familiar from other failed post-war British industries, lack of investment. We were in a very strong position, which alas we threw away as the years went on. Britain had lots of big brains, people who, were, who foresaw the future with rockets and space travel, uh, but this was not pursued by the British government. This is the story of the unsung pioneers of British space exploration. The rocket engineers, the scientists, and ultimately the dreamers, who despite lack of resources, never gave up on their vision for bringing the future into the present. The passion of a bunch of engineers made something happen which didn't have time to be useful and so was only delightful. The story of the British space race begins before the Second World War with the emergence of obscure rocket clubs dotted all over Europe. The British call theirs the BIS, the British Interplanetary Society. Leading member Arthur C. Clarke and his contemporaries dreamed of a space age in which Britain would be a forerunner. They really do assume that Britain would be involved. It seems natural to them that the same great power military industrial complex which built radar, built the Spitfire, will eventually be sending some squadron leader into orbit with his Winko moustache inside his spacesuit helmet. Arthur C. Clarke says in his memoirs, we were in the position of people who couldn't afford a car, but if we clubbed together could just about afford to buy the rear view mirror. That is about the level on which they're able to work. Rocket clubs, whether they were in the United Kingdom, Germany or the Soviet Union, um, pushed forward the idea of developing rockets and rocket technology. In Germany, of course, um, they were ideal recruiting grounds for the Wehrmacht developing what would become later the V1 and V2 weapons. What mattered most to every country in the world at this time was not space, but weaponry. Rockets could be adapted to carry missiles, and it was this that drove development. So when the British Interplanetary Society heard rumours of a new German rocket, they should have been alarmed. This rocket would go on to wreak havoc as the V2. The mastermind behind it was a space pioneer in waiting. There is only one place that the breakthrough happens. It is only because of Werner von Braun coming up with the V2 in Germany that brings rocket technology to the next stage of possibility. That very bloody and immoral birth without which there wouldn't be a space age. The invention of the V2 is on the whole very bad news for the population of London, but for the small group of British space enthusiasts in London. The news that the V2 exists is, is very good news. There is, in fact, a particular meeting of the British Interplanetary Society in November 1944 to talk about these rumours they've heard that the Germans have started building big rockets. And they're all sitting around rather gloomily gazing into their beer um, when a V2 falls not very far away. Suddenly there was a huge explosion because it travelled faster than the speed of sound. And the sound of it arriving uh, came after the explosion. It was quite a terrifying business. This group of all the groups of drinkers in London in November 1944 know what just happened. They know what it means um, if there's an explosion without the sound of bombers overhead. When the Allies captured German scientists after the war, there was a chance that Britain could get hold of von Braun's rocket expertise. I was in some ways 
quite astonished by what we found in Germany. It was like walking into an Aladdin's cave of advanced technology. It was, in some ways, quite a frightener to see how far along the line they had gone in, uh, in this sort of, if you like, rocket technology. As a test pilot with specialist engineering knowledge and a rudimentary grasp of German, Eric Brown was called upon to help interrogate the German scientists. Most of the scientists were not really politically motivated. What motivated them was they were given the opportunity to practice their profession with huge financial backing. And of course, it, well, they, it was their country, and they, I'm sure there was a sense of patriotism involved. The prize capture was Werner von Braun. All the Allies, including Britain, sorely coveted his rocket expertise, but he engineered his capture to be on American controlled territory. He was full of confidence that he felt he was giving himself as a gift to us. And this was because he was a brilliant scientist. There is no doubt about it. Von Braun, of course, himself had huge ideas in his own mind of where this was all going to lead to. And um, I would say he and a, a, an elite group of his scientists knew what the potential was, uh, which lesser men had not thought about. Werner von Braun said later, why did we decide to surrender to the Americans? Because we despised the French, we feared the Russians, and the British could not afford us. So if the best prize went to the United States, what did the UK take away from Germany? Water and hair dye? Well, not exactly. This apparently innocuous mixture would become a very special ingredient in the British rocket quest. Britain got, and later turned into its trademark, the German work on high-test peroxide, um, or HTP. Hydrogen peroxide is the same stuff that people use in, in hair bleacher. It's, 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 it's what makes peroxide blondes, except that the peroxide you use for turning your hair blonde is at about 4% concentration, whereas what you use in rockets is 20 times as concentrated. Peroxide is H2O2, water with an extra oxygen atom, and it looks like water, and it pours like water, um, and it's very convenient because you can treat it like water in lots of ways. Uh, we will go over to Seaside and see a demonstration of a gamma engine, and the firing officer is just going into the control room now, this gamma is another unit which we have developed at West and it forms the basis of the black light engine which has been developed by Armstrong Siddeley Motors. Now, in a matter of seconds, this engine will fire. So I'll just hang on for a, a minute. I think Five, a few four, three, seconds. two, one, fire. Here we go. You don't need to have complicated pyrotechnic ignition systems. All you have to do is to get your HTP blending with your rocket fuel, and the rocket runs on its own. It's hard to believe, but this simple mixture would give Britain a leading edge in the space race. Well, whatever you think of rockets, I think you must admit that that shock pattern is rather beautiful. This is a very characteristic technology for the British effort because it, what it offers is an, is an elegant simplification. It's a way of being brilliant by sidestepping some of the problems which other countries' programmes were getting bogged down on. Britain had bypassed the ignition problem. The only difficulty now was that HTP was very dangerous and could spontaneously combust. The rule on the test sites was always that you worked in twos. One man doing the job, whatever it might be, undoing these nuts, for instance, or whatever, and the other man standing by his side with a hose pipe running all the time. And if, if in fact, as you undo a nut, if something were to splash a little, straight away the other man would, 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 would hose your hands, the job, you, whatever it was. Now, we never actually had to use the, the next stage in anger, but at all the test sites, there were large baths. And these were for personnel immersion. So if one of your mates caught fire, you were supposed to pick him up and throw him in these baths. Because it's the only way to extinguish it and you know, save his life. Needless to say, a number of people ended up in the baths without being on fire. Because it was just, you know, someone would shout fire or something and throw the bloke in. 
and uh, it was all good for a laugh. It would be your turn next, if you know what I mean. While HTP was being investigated, the development of the hydrogen bomb was exercising Western minds. It needed a delivery system, a rocket that would turn it into a ballistic weapon. Britain responded by developing Blue Streak. It was a solid fuel rocket capable of launching a nuclear warhead from the British coast out of the atmosphere and down onto Moscow. It was one of many rockets developed at this time. They were primarily aimed for the national deterrent. But there's no doubt about it, the technology can be applied to other things and we knew this. And we weren't officially given time to think about that. You've got to just carry on with the main job in hand. All rockets were subjected to rigorous static testing in the British Isles, from Cumbria to the Midlands to the Isle of Wight. The British programme had to fit into the smaller, much more crowded geography of 1960s England. So it didn't happen off in the wilderness. It happened with the rest of British life going on around it. So that, for example, the, the test bed at Anstey in the Midlands got complaints from the maternity hospital next door about, um, about noise disturbance. The tests were certainly loud and looked alarmingly scary. We fired it for something like 10 seconds at a time to start with before we could work it up to 60 or 90 seconds. It was incredibly noisy, is my memory of it. And it produced a huge cloud of steam. We all stood a long way back because in the early days of rocket engines, a few had blown up, so it was a good idea to stand well away from it. The rockets didn't stay in one place. Often they were moved between firing stations. It was assembled into a vehicle at cows and taken the high down by the needles. You see this rather steep cliff. We had two, two test stands. They weren't launch stands, but they duplicated launch stands. You just didn't let things go. Everybody coming into Southampton could see this very strange sight of a, a jet of superheated steam firing sideways out of the white cliffs of the Isle of Wight. One of the engineers suggested that they, that they paint on the side of one of their sheds in very big letters, home of the British space programme, but um, his bosses said, no, 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 that would, um, you know, that, would, that, would, that would be against security, and what's more, it would be boasting as well. At the time, you didn't explain to your family what you were doing. Simple as that. I think my kids had some idea I was involved with rockets, but... Um, project names and what we were actually up to, no idea. My father was actually convinced I was in the space program and he kept telling all his friends that I was actually uh, orbiting, which was a bit of embarrassment. <laughs> but the main problem with British testing was that nowhere was quite remote enough to let the rockets go and fully launch them into the atmosphere. So the British government turned to the Australians. That is the end of a successful test and the rocket will now be packed and dispatched to Australia. And here it is in its crate. And now all is ready for the flight halfway around the world to Woomera. We were all pushing against time scale, I think, all the way along. That's what made it all exciting. You know, a date was fixed for flying. You had to have things ready for it. You couldn't afford to miss a boat because it was three months before you sent the next one out and things like that. And we only had one firing team, so we could only fire four a year at best of these things. Um, but it was also an arrangement where it was a project that wasn't to cost too much. And as long as we didn't spend more than two million a year, the RE was totally in charge. Unless you've driven down range at Woomera, you don't quite realise what the outback is how bad it can be. I know the first time I went down, it was sort of like, oh, this is a joke. They took me to a cairn where Giles' favourite camel died of thirst. <laughs> you suddenly realise, you know, that the water you brought was the only one that was within 350 miles of where you were. Rockets from all over the world were taken to Woomera. In its five decades as a launch pad, 4,000 rockets in all were launched from there.
30 second countdown, which is entirely automatic, and you all just sat there. And it went up, you know, um, and it goes straight up rather fast. You know, so they disappear into the blue yonder in no time at all, and all the things you're there for, the experiments, all happen out of sight. You know, you just stand there and say, well, I wonder what's happened, <laughs> and so on. I know we designed the experiments with ideas of what was going to happen, and we sat there and observed it. It wasn't like that at all. <laughs> you know, you had to go back and say, hey, the theory's all wrong, lads. It was assumed that, you know, Woomera would become this Commonwealth spaceport and that um, all kinds of space exploration uh, missions would would begin there. And there were any number of science fiction stories written both in Britain and Australia during this period that would, would have the first mission to the moon beginning from Australia, uh, you know, with a British and or British Australian crew. A great expectation that we would be there conquering space. But of course, the Russians got there first. When the Sputnik satellite was launched on October the 4th, 1957, it set in train fears that Russia could launch an attack on the West from space. Do you admire the Russians for doing it or not? No, definitely not. I said we should have been the first ones to have it. We fear this. We fear that they have something out that majority of the people don't know about. Somebody's fallen down on a job, badly. As atomic testing and space science quickly gathered pace, public anxiety grew. Were our scientific endeavours being achieved at the expense of mankind? Belief in UFOs and possession by beings from other planets became rife, and the television of the day highlighted these very new concerns. Earth, as you call it, faces a certain situation, a dangerous one. You are liable uh, to upset uh, the balance of your Earth through number one, atomic experimentation, and number two, your deviation uh, from uh, the spiritual laws. What Mr. King is really doing, perhaps, through what may well be total delusion, is nevertheless uttering in one way, in a symbolic form, the cry of anxiety that divides our world, that our scientific interest has outrun our wisdom and our humanity in some respects, and we're afraid that it may outrun our existence. But we shall delude ourselves if we think that there is no significance in these fears and their expression in this form. Psychological fears about military rockets were matched in magnitude by very British economic concerns. Britain was very hard up after the war, of course. We were a bankrupt country. Of course, we helped to get Germany back on its feet financially, uh, and the result was uh, our own industries were neglected. It was a very, very sad period. In the late 50s, as a BBC reporter, Reg Turnill asked the Minister of Supply, Aubrey Jones, about government funding. He got a typical response. Why has it been done so cheaply? I think the answer to that is that if we do all our research on a shoestring compared with the Americans, I think we were forced to do so by our more limited resources. Britain had lots of big brains, people, and they drifted away. Most of our best brains went off to work in America, and that was known as the brain drain. With such an attitude, it was no surprise when the Macmillan government decided to cancel Blue Streak in 1960. Its development costs were soaring, and the proposed rocket silos on the Norfolk coast were seen to be rather too close to North Sea oil rigs, which would in themselves be a target. It was cheaper for the UK to buy Polaris from the USA instead. Military development on Blue Streak stopped. It would have its place in future space plans, but for the moment it was destined for the scrap heap. In 1975, the BBC's Horizon programme took engineer Geoffrey Pardo to an abandoned Blue Streak hangar. The only Blue Streak rocket remaining fully intact lies in an old Second World War hangar outside Edinburgh. It's a sad relic of Britain's prouder days. The heart of the whole thing came back to the two Rolls-Royce rocket engines here. 
two chambers which together produced about a quarter of a million pounds of thrust with the liquid propellant being delivered from the turbo pumps inside this bay, very high technology, very advanced turbo pumps, and then the tankage section ahead of this. You know, this got a very bad press through the years, but it worked every time in its development shots, and uh, it really was one of the most successful rockets in that sense built. This uh, slightly stiffened kerosene bay here, and the liquid oxygen tank here, it's really, you know, just a long pressurized stainless steel balloon. The wall thickness, 19 thousandths of an inch. A few thicknesses of paper, and it's the pressure in it which kept it stiff throughout its flight. And of course, allowed the very low weight to be achieved so that the propulsion system, the electronics could carry the warhead, which would have been inside this bay here. But Blue Streak wasn't quite dead. It would have a role in space research. With input from the French, Italians and West Germans, ELDO, the European Launcher Development Organization, was set up to develop a European satellite launcher called Europa. Blue Streak was to be used as its first stage. And snapping at Europa's heels was a new, solely British venture called Black Arrow. Black Arrow would use the British signature technology of high-test peroxide, now engineered almost to perfection since the war. But government investment in the satellite launcher was limited. You do what you can. We run projects on, you know, with a PERT system, and all the logic of what, how all things fit together. And when you can't get things done, you have to repackage the program to see what, how you can save time and things like that. While the British made do on threadbare budgets, more wealthy nations competed for space milestones. Russia launched the first man into space. And of course, Reg Turnill was there to find out more. My colleague Reginald Turnill, the BBC's air correspondent, is here with me. And Reg, come and join me just one second. If you have any chance at all of asking a question at this press conference this afternoon, what would be the one that you would put? We still don't know how the Russians can launch these enormous things, whether they've got just very big rockets of the sort we use or whether they've got some special sort of fuel that we don't know about. This was a major achievement for Soviet science and for our country, but it was also a major achievement for world science and for the people of the whole world. The space race was entirely military oriented. We wouldn't have landed a man on the moon now if there hadn't been this contest between the Russians and America uh, to get to the moon because the, uh, the military men uh, put forward this crazy idea, and I was briefed about it many times, that the man on the high ground dominates the world. So the theory was that you better get to the moon first because whoever was at the moon uh, would call the tune militarily, you see. It was the USA that won the goal for which Werner von Braun had defected to the West. Some British scientists were also part of the brain drain that helped Apollo 11 put Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin onto the surface of the moon. In my view, the Americans had got to the moon on German rockets, American dollars and British brains. It was not wholly true, but there was a lot in it. NASA soak up budgets like nobody's business and sadly don't produce the results that we know we could have done on a much more cost-effective basis with smaller teams. They have enormous teams. We've always said they trample their problems to death, whereas we used to have to sit down and, and solve them at a desk. When it comes down to brass tacks, they're not producing anything better technologically than we were. By 1971, British politicians were getting twitchy. Debate was raging over whether the UK should continue with rocket development while the USA was offering us free piggyback rides into space. British money could surely be spent better on public services and infrastructure. 
Meanwhile, Black Arrow was on its way to Australia to prepare for an all-British milestone, the launching of a satellite into space. Heath's Minister for Aerospace stood up in the House of Commons and announced that the Black Arrow programme was cancelled. But the engineers were, were given the chance to, to try to prove their system just once more, since the rocket was already on its way, everything was already in place. So they knew before they tried to launch that to succeed or fail, the programme was already over, that success was not actually going to accomplish anything. The satellite, due to be launched into orbit, underwent a name change. Instead of Puck, the Shakespearean sprite who flies round the world with ease, the engineers renamed it Prospero, after the tired magician who lays down his books. Could they pull off one last magic trick to prove that Britain could get into orbit? Man years of their work and their dedication and their passion and their very serious professional design skills were were invested in this thing. So, with the most loving caution imaginable, the, the team set it up on its launch site at Woomera and began the countdown, stopping for everything that looked as if it could conceivably go wrong because this was their last chance. But nothing did go wrong. The last flight of Black Arrow was successful and the satellite Prospero was launched over 550 kilometers into orbit. Great elation all round the department. The little ministry man turned up at, at Amsty and we all got together in the drawing office to listen to his words because we thought he'd come to tell us how well we'd done and what the next phase would be. And all the little so-and-so had come to tell us is that uh, it was a good job, wasn't it? Please wrap it up and send the bill in. And it, it's resented even to this day. You talk to people and they say it was a bad day, wasn't it? Any mention of Prospero and they, they almost start to weep, if you say to me. The British government thought it had learned by experience in the 1960s that space was a waste of money. The irony here is that the last ride of Black Arrow happens only a very few years before the great age of the commercial satellite begins, when all of the money which had been fired up into orbit started raining down. Ariane, which the French went ahead with, as much for reasons of you know, national technological pride as from commercial calculations, was a commercial success, um, because it was there and ready in the late 1970s. Um, Black Arrow would now be a very handy rocket launcher. There are lots of 100 kilogram satellites. It would be nice to launch from Woomera. The UK pulled out of rocketry altogether and uh, all, we settled down. The government decided that our scientific establishments uh, could provide components uh, for other people's satellites and expertise and so on. So we became uh, small bit players in the whole thing. The old imperial power Great Britain was starting to lose her way. She reduced her majority share in the European Launcher Development Organization and pulled out British engineers. Whereas the far-sighted French carried on with a very profitable launching business, British rocket engineering became a thing of the past. Over the next few decades, UK governments wavered with intermittent space funding and a largely fruitless search for private investment. Our politicians have taken the view Certainly, I know it was true how, how they worked with the French, that if we'd so got something small that wanted launching, you ask one of the others to do it for you. And this brings us to the point where the British government made years back a decision that they would distance themselves from what they call launchers. Not the satellites, they still make those. And they always screw it to the side of a London bus, if you like. They just happen to be going the right way and ask them to kick it off at such and such a tube station. And it goes into its own little orbit and the rest goes on and does something else. And this is very sad. That ruins all the work that we did straight away. It throws it in the bin because the technology for making satellites smaller, better, more capable doesn't require any rocket engine technology at all. 
it meant that instead of being a second-class nation as we were after the war, we're now a third-class nation, and nobody thinks we can afford to do anything. Of course, we could, really. We should, the French decide to do something and worry about the money after. The rest of the 20th century saw Britain half-heartedly supporting various space projects. The hotel horizontal takeoff and landing idea came and went. The British National Space Centre was set up. This is a very exciting time for space. It was a very important day for the space industry in Britain. And then hit badly by withdrawal of funding seven years later. When Halley's Comet came, British-built Giotto was there to photograph it. But a year later, the UK effectively pulled out of the European Space Agency by refusing to back French astronauts with British money. It is quite correct that we have not been able to find the extremely considerable amount of extra expenditure that was requested. We shall continue our subscription to the European Space Agency, but at present we're not able to find more money. It seemed the British had deserted the questing space spirit until only very recently. Good evening. Look up into the southeast, Felideton, and there you will see the red planet Mars. And in August, it will be as close to us as it can ever be, less than 35 million miles. And can there be life there? That's what we want to find out, and I think soon we'll do so. By the 21st century, Britain's main technological focus had shifted to satellites and probes and received little attention from the public. But then Mars came close to Earth and British scientists had a once-in-a-lifetime chance to get there. The public found themselves enthralled. 30 seconds to go, and will this search for life on Mars get off the ground? There's no stopping the countdown now. The ignition sequence is about to begin. Any second, the main engines will start. There they go right now. You can hear the rumble and see the flames. There's so much riding on this. Europe's first mission to Mars, Britain's first attempt to find life beyond Earth. And here it goes, any second now. When the Beagle probe was launched from Kazakhstan on a Russian rocket, British scientist Professor Colin Pillinger and his team stepped back into the arena of space, where Britain had always been a third-class citizen. We couldn't wait. Mars came around, it was the closest it was ever going to be. We knew we had one chance and we were going to go for it in, a, in a, a single shot. In the spirit of great explorers, it was decided to name the probe Beagle 2 after Darwin's quest to find new life forms on the HMS Beagle expedition to South America. Pillinger played up the pioneer explorer role of his own search for life on Mars and the media indulgently reported the project as Britain's latest great boffin space quest. Professor Colin Pillinger is rather proud that his Mars spacecraft, Beagle 2, fits in a supermarket trolley. This is eccentric, ingenious, underfunded British science at its best. These are some of the people who will be running Beagle 2. Now, when most of us think of mission control, we imagine some huge room at NASA with hundreds of people. Well, for Beagle 2, this is mission control. An upstairs room at the Open University in Milton Keynes. Well, Beagle was overhyped. Uh, this was why it was such a disappointment, of course. It got too much publicity for once. Hopes of finding the Beagle 2 Mars probe are fading rapidly. The scientists behind the British mission have admitted their best chance of making contact with Beagle 2 has failed. But Beagle's chief scientist wasn't giving up and would hear no talk of failure. We have suddenly demonstrated that people are interested in science and technology. And we have to capitalise on that. Space missions go wrong at launch. In the case of Beagle, we always looked at everything that uh, we achieved as another tick in the box. The team knew the risks, the team knew the, the, the things that uh, you, they had to do. The media were almost 
more broken hearted than we were when we didn't get that signal from Beagle 2. People were really taken by surprise when, when Beagle 2 became famous. They were surprised to know that they were allowed to hope for Britain to do that kind of thing because Britain does virtual engineering these days. And I think it's because of Beagle that people are now thinking again about the almost forgotten history of the British space programme. You have to appreciate that uh, it isn't easy to launch things into space and it certainly isn't easy to get to Mars. And I would be very, very sad if people took this as a one-off nasty dream. It's now gone away. We're never going to ever do this again. Because, you know, it is absolutely certain that if we kept going in the rocket program, it would have been Blue Streak, not Ariane. I wish we could have made more of it, but I do understand the reasons why we couldn't. And quite honestly, I really do want to know what's out there. Up in our roof at home, there's a whole long 20-odd foot shelf of projects that might have been, and still people don't want them. And I said to my wife the other day, shall we throw these out? And she says, no, the world just hasn't caught up with these things yet. And they're still there, and we did experiments to prove that they would work. And it's very frustrating. But that's why. We should remember that uh, both Australia and Britain had the vision of space. The dream has always been there and it remains there. And although you can look back and, and say with some, you know, bitterness at times, look what we gave up, you can also look back and say, look what we achieved. In some ways, the peculiarities of, of, of British boffins are a sign of, of the threadbare footing they've been forced to do their engineering on. What we need is to, is to retire boffins and just have engineers instead, preferably engineers with large enough budgets. We should be looking to get back into manned spaceflight. Uh, that's the only way we're going to encourage our young people. And it's never too late. Uh, it's not good to be late, but better late than never. Coming up next this evening here on BBC Four, actresses, writers, scientists and even soldiers, all female, as Lucy Worsley unearths the remarkable story of the 17th century's lady pioneers in the final part of Harlot's Housewives and Heroines, next. <laughs> 